Throughout the 70s, Britain was in crisis. There weren't a lot of great prospects for a person. We live here, this is as far as we're going to get. Kind of showed this raw need to express ourselves. Learning the guitar, there was an instinct that it was possibly a way out. I could start my own band, you know, and that was a determination to prove you can be who you want to be. They had it all. The sky was the limit. They had balls. It was as if it gave kids a blood transfusion. This is about empowering the audience. I was like, God, he really means his lyrics. I thought, right, that's the real deal. That's how I feel. The band was at its best. The audience were right behind us, and some serious rock and roll happened. You're a rock and roller, you think you're indefeatable. It was a shock. You assume that everybody you love and care for is going to live forever. I was um, diagnosed with leukemia. I don't like the unknown, the uncertainty. I didn't know whether Mike was going to be alive in six months. Cancer's not going to stop life going on, it's not going to stop our records coming out. I got this idea to go into a psychological warfare with cancer and kit myself in combat fatigues. And I said, I'm not taking these off till I'm healed. It was a way of him really focusing himself on the battle he had ahead. I'm fighting back. Take that, cancer. That's rock and roll for you, isn't it? We're digging in for the big <laughs> adventure. We created the Love Hope Strength charity to climb mountains in the fight against cancer. When Mike said, let's climb Everest, I'm like, put your wife on. No. Mike has found the perfect vehicle to give back. Change the world takes a long time. It's hard. It's like, who is this guy? <laughs> you know? He is the hardest working man in show business. He doesn't stop. He's one of these rock and roll can save your soul guys. And he believes it. I worry. I mean, honestly, does he push it too far? Being a dad, being a husband, playing a rock and roll band, you only get out of life what you fight for. So here I am. Are you touring? Yeah. <laughs> just keep going. Coming here for a rest. <laughs> Indeed. Well, it's been a few years. It has, Mark, yeah. <laughs> Lots happened. A lot of water under the bridge. We, uh, you know, yeah, it's been, uh, I don't know, what, 30 something, yeah, something, something years? Yeah, that's right. I'm Good at the point you. now where I have to deny that I was in the in the alarm because it gives me age away. Uh, <laughs> I feel the same way. I never worked at MTV. <laughs> same it, deal. That, yeah. It's just I was an imposter. It was, um, so people just saw the, uh, the, the trailer for Man in the Camo Jacket. It's... It's a really powerful documentary. It is, um, it's a story of struggle, which you struggle seems to be, you know, your middle name, <laughs> almost. It has been, yeah, um, times, but yeah. But struggle with yourself, struggle with your career, struggle with, uh, obviously, with, with cancer. It documents this incredible trip up uh, Mount Everest. You That's and right. 38 other uh, musicians, uh, a great metaphor, that, that trip uh, up the mountain. And... I guess the, my first question after watching the film a number of times is, how are you feeling right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, good to be alive. There you go. <laughs> and always appreciative of that fact. And that's, I think that's what cancer teaches you, that you are lucky to be here in New York City on AOL, uh -huh. doing a build a program. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm very fortunate. And so you're, you're feeling good? There's, you know, you're yeah, in look, I've, remission? I've, or? I've been on the uh, chemotherapy for since 1995 and i'm mm -hmm. still still here uh, i take oral chemotherapy now i've uh, i sometimes say it's like a rise in a bad wave if you're a surfer and you just get on the on the curl and you're at the top and i've just luckily enough been in that position for a long time never fallen into the deep water yeah. and uh, and the the all the advances in science that have come along to benefit mankind. Well, I've been the beneficiary of those right from the very beginning, from trial drugs. And for some reason, luckily, fate, whatever it is, I've always been able to stay one step ahead of the, the uh, illness itself. It's never actually caught me. Maybe that's uh, well, there is running th fast. That line in the movie about <laughs> cancer never saw you coming. That's right. <laughs> you know, you didn't see cancer coming and cancer never saw you coming. And that's... You know, a, kind of a classic 
Yeah, that, that was something uh, I said. I got invited to speak at the World Cancer Congress in Melbourne, Australia. And uh, I don't think the cancer community of scientists and, and uh, people like that, people that run charitable organisations or run the drug companies, the real frontline people in the struggle against cancer, they, they'd never really so much seen someone come onto the stage on the podium and address them with a guitar, camo jacket. Right. <laughs> and I, I just spoke like myself and uh, you know, I'm a rock and roll guy, so speech me is like the gap between two songs. You want to get the crowd engaged, get them up, ready to start going for the next song. And, and that's how I spoke to them. And I did say, uh, you know, um, Cancer never saw me yeah. come in, and uh, so uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think, but there's a lot of us now mm -hmm. that are winning the struggles against cancer. There's a lot of people who are on these new drugs who are living with cancer. They're not passing away through it; they're living with it, and that's a big difference. Yeah. And uh, and I think a lot of people have pushed cancer so that it is on the run. It is in the death throes of its own existence, and and whether that happens in our lifetime or for the, the children to come. It is going to happen at some point. We are going to tackle this illness yeah. called cancer yeah, yeah. for one and all. And thanks to you, there's, <laughs> well, there's a lot of, a lot of advance. Not, not that you, you yourself are going to cure cancer, but you've really helped to make some great strides. I, I, I want to, one of the great things about the, the film is that it really does give a cool overview of, of your career with the alarm and before. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and I love getting that glimpse of you even before we knew you here in the United States and one of those big moments you talk about in the film is is when the sex pistols burst onto the scene that that completely changed the trajectory of your life I think right Absolutely. and changed you as a writer how how would you characterize that what was what was that moment to you well, as an artist it was a a release really from uh, the, the the person that you're brought up in the mold of how your parents see or how your community expect you to be you know I was uh, brought up in a small town in Wales and and uh, and presented with the opportunities that a small town could offer and that meant a job in a airplane factory putting rivets in airplanes and building wings and I thought well maybe there's just a bit more to life than that and when I saw the sex pistols that kind of confirmed an instinct I had and obviously I saw them uh, in 1976 before they were known and uh, and their words were anarchy in the UK submission words that are pretty vacant I, I did, they didn't teach me those words in school certainly where I come from so it, it was ask and you'll receive so I, I literally went up to the after the show and tried to talk to Johnny Rotten and and went Mr. Rotten you know so polite I didn't even call him Johnny I said Mr. Rotten and uh, and he looked down at me and I said what's anarchy in the UK and he said oh, F off mate <laughs> and uh, that was it and, but it was like a you know you, Bono used that phrase when we came to America in 1983 that that war the music was a, a slap in the face for pop music and and that's what the Sex Pistols did me. They basically slapped me in the face and woke me up to what I could be as an individual. And it, it's fascinating because you, you talk about that in the film, that it, it changed everything that you had written. You know, the stuff that you had written previously was almost irrelevant to you at, at that point. Um, one, one of your early songs also is, is um, kind of a motif for the movie, Unsafe Building. Is, is a great song, and it's one that I, I think here in America is probably not all that well known. No, it's the first song I, I wrote that really represented who I felt I was or could become. Um, I was uh, we, with the band The 17 that became The Alarm. We were playing in the Marquee Club in London with the Stray Cats, and um, I found out about John Lennon being assassinated here in New York. Uh, on the, I was on the tube train into London and saw a man with a newspaper and said John Lennon had been murdered in New York. And, and it just made me, again, it was like realising that, hang on, what, what, I'm just in this band because we want to be famous and get chased by girls in the street and have all the things that the Beatles had had. And, it, and that just felt, in that moment, very vacuous and, and meaningless. And I thought, really, if we're only going to get somewhere, we need to have really solid songs and music that make make a connection and unsafe building was the first song i thought i, I, I just had that, that. that's such a fantastic metaphor to declare yourself an unsafe building <laughs> yeah, it's, um, well, it's it, what's, what's the status of the building today this is a long time ago <laughs> still unsafe it. as unsafe as I ever was and i think that's uh, you have to be a little bit unsafe to be receptive you know uh, uh, that that you've got to uh, always be prepared to accept that what you are might need to be taken down and, and rebuilt to face the future. You can't live a life in music as long as I have and not have to go back and think, 
and contradict yourself. You know, the things you say you are in 1980, but they're not necessarily going to be the tools you need to survive in the music industry of 2017. So you have to reinvent yourself all the time. And, and the lines in Unsafe Building, rethink your values, rethink yourself right through. That, that's, that's something I always go back to. You almost have to be prepared. Another great alarm song is uh, tear it all down, smash it all up, break it down, and build it back up again. And I think uh, I've had to do that many points in my life. And uh, that music has served as a soundtrack and as a reminder. I have to live by the lyrics I've written. You, and the, the lyrics to that song, that Unsafe Building has changed quite a bit. I've seen a lot of different... Uh, ver the, well, the first version was just a flat out, just an acoustic thing, and then you rocked it up. There's there's verses that have come and have gone. Um, but it, initially, the song was kind of directed at the young, at, at youth. That's right. Has that now changed for you 30 some odd years later? I think it changed a little bit because uh, my audience has grown with me. I'm lucky enough to have an audience that have followed yeah. my music career and stood with me. Uh, someone who's a big fan of the alarm, Bono from U2. That, the unsafe building is still his mm -hmm. favorite alarm song. I keep thinking, it's the first one I wrote. Can't you like well, one of the loud ones? <laughs> Let me send you some, <laughs> yeah, some, send stuff. some new stuff. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think uh, the, the fact that it's like, you know, a lot of people's favorite U2 song is something like I Will Follow the, sn the songs from Boy. There, that's the foundation. That's the music that your future career is built upon. Mm -hmm. and, and I like to think we had a really, although it was an unsafe building, it was still a very solid foundation. So you could take the facade down right. but, and there was plenty of room to put new walls up, new roof and a, and a new vision. And uh, so I, I'll, I'll always be unsafe. And I wasn't, I wasn't sure where you were going to go with that. I thought, <laughs> well, now I'm older and I'm safe now. I'm, things are cool. <laughs> well, I think, you know, some of the songs, you know, uh, we are the kids, I yeah. would sing, you know, now. I sing, we are the people. Yeah. Uh, and you, you do, you know, when you're young and, and, and the world's in front of you, you see it as the world belongs to us. Mm -hmm. But then as you get older, you realize that, that are, you know, you're gonna come in, you're gonna start to relate to the older generations as you go older yourself. And, as and frightening uh, as that might be. It, it is, yeah. <laughs> but you still don't have to use, lose your youthful exuberance. Well, you, it, the, the youth thing, Look, you're in a business that is, is youth-oriented, you know, somehow, and although certainly it's been around for 50 years or whatever, yeah. it's still, that's sort of what it's founded on, the youth and the, and the spirit of youth. And y you did something in 2004, and I remember when this happened, <laughs> and I just thought, this was the coolest idea ever with 45 RPM. You, just, just run us through <laughs> the thinking on this <laughs> song. You, you were, were recording, and the alarm had been through madness, and... And yeah. you came back with this song, and you thought, well, tell us what you thought. Well, I think it, it was uh, in 2003, uh, we were recording, and we were re really bringing the alarm back into being again. The band had reconvened with new lineup, right. you know, new vision again. And, um, and everyone wanted to hear new music, and, and uh, I felt like one album wasn't enough, so I had to write five albums to kind of fill in all the gaps and tell everything that was needed to be said. So it, it opened us up to trying ideas that we might not have considered. And so we came up with this song called 45 RPM, and we, we all went to the pub for a pint after we'd recorded it, and we all sat around, and we were all going, oh, if this was by a brand new young band, it'd be a massive hit, you know, as you, a lot of people say that. So we decided to kind of put it to the test and we took it to a, um, a radio plugger in London and said, what do you think of this? And he didn't even want to hear it at first. And we had to pretend we were managing a young band. And at the end of the conversation, we played this record to him by a new band called the Poppy Fields from Wales. And he said to me, Mike, I can get this on the radio like that, you know, and he clicked his fingers. And I said, well, that's actually the Alarms record. And and, and off it went. And we, and I just think because we, we were... reveal it to the public right now. No, no. Well, he said, give me a week can play it to the Radio 1 and, and all that in the BBC and MTV and, and let me see what they come back and say and I'll do exactly, I'll present it to them like you presented it to me as if it's a new band. And he, he called me up a week later, he said, Mike, I've had an amazing response. Everyone loves 45 RPM. The enemy are going to do a single review. It's going to go on the playlist on Radio 1. And I said to him, what did they say when you told them it was the alarm? And he goes, well, they, they went so crazy I didn't dare tell them it was Oops. the alarm. <laughs> Forgot to mention that. Yeah, so so we ran with the whole thing and we, we, we created a fake website. We got four young kids to pretend to be the alarm in the video. Um, we, we put the record into the UK 
top 26 and and it went on the top of the pops run down and we revealed it was the alarm in disguise and next minute the story blew up all around the world it was biggest thing that happened to the alarm since 68 guns and the stand in 1983 and uh it was it was really exciting it came to new york we did tv shows out here and in la and in australia it, it was incredible what, what do you think that you proved by doing that well, I, I think um, that uh, I don't think I don't necessarily we proved anything, but we, we but we just we actually uh, showed that music can be if it's good, then that is really what it should all be about. Not how old the group or how new the group is. You know, at the time, BBC had this saying: "In new music, we trust." And we're thinking, what well, what about good music? Shouldn't we be trusting in that? And it just seemed that we were making a stand, not just for ourselves, but for artists of our generation and above, who um, are suddenly deemed that what they can't be on the radio because they've reached a certain age. That just seems ridiculous to me. And uh, I think we proved that as a fairly decent point. If uh, for people who watch. Man in the Camo Jacket, the, what happens over and over with whatever obstacle, whether it's you know, the potential of not being, getting your song on the radio to being diagnosed, it's, there's, there's battles being fought, and you seem to, to spark to the idea of, of a battle. Um, so just as far as, as this film is concerned, uh, talk about the, the first time you were diagnosed, when you were first diagnosed in 90... 95. Four, 95, and what that was and how you came to this this decision that is really, I think, the kind of decision that ev everyone who, and, and I think by now we all know people mm. who have had this, this battle, you came to a decision. Can you describe like what it was to be diagnosed, how you came to that decision and what, you know, what that decision was. Yeah, well, well, a lot of it was luck, to be honest, uh, at the very beginning, because um, I, I was touring in the UK on the eve of a, coming to do a big American tour, coast to coast. And um, I was in the tour bus in, in the UK and I could feel a lump I could lift up and above and below my collarbone. And I, I thought, well, that's, what's that? You know, and, and I just thought I was tired and been overdoing it on the road. So I went to see my doctor and he, he straight away referred me to go to a blood test at the hospital. And where I lived at the time, there was no cancer center or anything like that. So I just went to hospital for a blood test. I had no idea what was coming. Uh, the nurse asked me to give blood and she said, and I was on the way to a gig. My brother was waiting in the car, Jules, my wife was with me. And, and she said, oh, the doctor just wants to see her for a few minutes after the test. So I hung around and went into the office and then a sheet of paper came across the desk and it had, let's talk about cancer written on it. And I just went into a kind of a whiteout. And uh, even the doctor could see I was gone into shock. And he, he said, look, Mike, I'm giving you this leaflet so you can read about it tonight and let's talk about it, how we're going to cure you tomorrow. And within minutes, I was out in the car with my brother I didn't even know what happened. I was in shock. And we, uh, next minute, I wake up and I'm at home. And uh, we're putting the kettle on because we're British. To make a cup of tea, as you do. And, um, and then he's picking up the phone. I said, who are you calling? He said, well, I'm phoning the gig. We're going to cancel the gig tonight. I said, no, put the phone down. Let's go. And we drove to the show and played the show. And I, I just thought if I'd stayed at home and, f and tried to sort of come to terms with what was happening, I, I didn't have the knowledge or the skill set to understand what was really coming my way. And I thought, well, let's, let's go and just play a gig because that's what I do know. That's where I'm most alive. So let's dive into that. And it was yeah. pure instinct, obviously driven by fear, but it led me into a good place. The show must go on. I'm a musician. And, um, and I think that enabled to keep me alive. And so when they said to me the next morning, OK, Mike, we're going to go for cure. We're going to do a bone marrow transplant. We're, you're young. We're going to get you alive. We're going to keep you well. I said, that's fine. And we're going to start tomorrow. I said, well, that's all right and good. But I'm actually going on a plane to America tomorrow for an American tour. And, uh, and I said, look, if I cancel the tour, it's so negative. There's, there's more negatives. Right taking a tour down and actually going and playing it. And I said, I'd have to explain myself. It was going to be terrifying. So I, I, they agreed in the end I could do the tour. And, and so I, I bought the camo jacket and, and uh, went to war in my head. And, and it's kept me alive ever since. 
And that's that idea, the idea of the man in the camo jacket, that that was sort of this, the symbol in the world for, you, for your, your battle. That's right. I just it, love that. Well, my uh, manager at the time was a guy called Ian Wilson. He'd, he'd been U2's agent when we started out. And uh, he, he, I'd known him all my life, but he said, Mike, you don't know this about me. When I've got friends in trouble, I asked them to speak to a faith healer. Would you do that? And I said, Ian, I'll try anything right now. And her name was Bambi. And I spoke to her and she said, green, Mike, I'm seeing green when yeah. I'm speaking to you. And, and so that turned into a, combat, a psychological combat zone. Right. And, uh, and it stood me in really good stead ever since. And uh, here I am. Uh, we're going to go and take some questions from the audience in a second. But I, I want to just, one of the, the, the focus of the movie, I think, is that trip up Mount Everest. You and 38 musicians uh, to play what you call the highest concert in the world. That's right. Um, how, how did you come to that decision, and what was what was the purpose of that? Well, I was uh, having treatment in hospital in North Wales, and uh, out of the window, I could see the summit of Mount Snowdon, which is the highest mountain in England and Wales. And, and to me, I felt that was symbolic of if I could regain my health and go to a place where I could get to with relatively easily with mm -hmm. good health, that would symbolize that I've come back from this battle against cancer. And I resolved to take all the alarm fans to the summit, and play a gig and support the cancer services in the shadow of the mountain. And um, through process, I ended up in playing a concert in Texas at South by Southwest. I met James Chippendale, the co-founder of Love Hope Strength Foundation. And I was telling him my ideas about going to Snowden. And obviously, he's a Texan. So <laughs> stuff Mount Snowden, let's go to Everest. <laughs> <laughs> and before we knew it, we were organizing. We were just on the phones planning a trip with Sherpas and mountaineering expedition companies. And I was phoning Glenn Tilbrook from Squeeze, Slim Jim Phantom from the Stray Cats. And, and we, and we pull, pulled off this amazing event. It was sheer will, luck, foolhardy, everything that you could possibly throw into an adventure happened. Uh, and it um, was the most amazing thing. The Love Hope Strength Foundation came out of it. And, and James and I were both um, treated through different healthcare systems, the UK mm -hmm. and the USA. And through the mission, we tried to, we wanted to equalize and, and give people in other parts of the world who didn't have access to the same kind of treatments, medical teams and facilities that kept us alive. We wanted to give them that same fighting chance. So all the funds we raised on Everest Rocks went into building a cancer center in, in Kathmandu, the Back to Ball Cancer Center. And we did similar events in uh, Africa with Kilimanjaro and- To and, raise uh, cancer centers. And to, to help build cancer centers. And uh, so that we've, you know, we've done it a lot over the years and we've got some more adventures planned for the future. That's amazing, fantastic. <laughs> um, I, I know we've gone a little bit long here and I know we have some questions from the audience. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll jump to those. Uh, Who's first? Hi. Hi. Mike. How are you? Uh, so I was wondering about that Everest uh, trip. Uh, was it uh, difficult to get convince uh, band members or other uh, crew members to come up with you? And I know, I guess you did Kilimanjaro. Are you planning to do any other high altitude uh, concerts? Yeah, it, yeah. Well, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't difficult to get musicians. I think there's there's plenty of musicians who would want to come. It's such an exciting adventure, uh, but obviously they've got their touring schedules to think of. Uh, um, um, somehow we ended and up. And the fact that they don't go walking up <laughs> yeah, giant true, mountains yeah, yeah. every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's that as well. But um, an actual the mountain surprisingly really bonded us all together as a great group. Not just the musicians, but the survivors that were with us and the other hikers, fundraisers, and we became like one big band going up the mountain when the sheer community realized we were raising funds that would benefit their children and their community they couldn't do it they virtually carried us up the mountain and we did concerts on the way and people coming over the mountains and it really engaged with the people of Nepal and and the, they threw a big concert for us in Dubar Square and they couldn't do enough for us it was a, it was incredible seeing humanity really come together and forgetting about all the differences N none of that existed we were all there to, to help each other and it was a beautiful thing and uh, and so yeah, we're, we're planning adventures for 2018. When, when, maybe instead of going high, we're maybe going to go low. We're looking at doing a, events down in the Grand Canyon in the Canyonlands of America. So that'll be a great. I was adventure. just wondering, how are you playing instruments underwater? You're going what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, we'll find a way. <laughs> <laughs> right. Who else? Hi, how are you? Hi. My question is, when making this documentary, what was the most enjoyable part of this film, mm -hmm. and then what was the most difficult part to work on? Well, uh, probably the most difficult part was uh, realizing that I, I used to, in the 80s, before FaceTime and all this kind of stuff and AOL and internet, uh, I used to make, I, I, I bought um, 
the first video camera when it came up that had that you could record sound. So that's why I was able to capture a lot of stuff. And so I handed over my tapes to Russ, the uh, the, the, the director, and. Uh, I didn't. I didn't really look through them, and so the difficult part for me was actually seeing me portrayed in my underwear, on in the in the, from sending a message home to my wife, a private message, and I'd realised I hadn't sent those tapes. So my my whole life is bared for all to see. Uh, that was a bit, a bit difficult, but um, <laughs> it's, but it's uh, but uh, it was. Um, I think. Um, I've got to take hats off to Russ Kendall, director, Alex Coletti, producer, James Chippendale, the team. They were really um, uh, uh, put a lot of value into what we did. Uh, for instance, one of the first events we did to raise funds to go to Everest was on the Empire State Building. And, and we took Billy Duffy from the cult and Dave Wakeling from the English Beat. We climbed the steps to the summit of the, uh, the Empire State. And it was in the middle of a nor'easter. It was the worst weather New York had ever seen. And uh, we had to do the gig in a gift shop. You know, we said, there's a long way to go to play a gig in a gift shop. <laughs> and, but Alex Coletti, who's a producer, who created Unplugged and everything like that, he was, uh, he said, Mike, we, we can't just film this on your 1980s video camera. We've got to do this in high definition. And, and that, that really enabled us eventually to tell an incredible story. And when you can see he's going to Everest and Kilimanjaro or myself being treated, it's all filmed in a way that people can really see what's actually going on. And, and I think that's part of the beauty of the film is that people can take a lot away from from this when they see it, if they find themselves in that position, it can maybe help take the fear away. It can give them some hope that if it happens to them, they will have a fighting chance. If they work closely with their medical teams and stay positive throughout, then hopefully everyone can live. That's great. We have one more question, I think. Hi. Hi. So I was just wondering what, uh, if any, is the biggest lesson you uh, would want people to take away from this film? Well, I think uh, ultimately, I, I think people, have no need to be f fearful of cancer anymore. Yes, some people are gonna walk in through the doors of the hospital and they're not gonna come back. But they might get a day, they might get a month to live more than they would normally have. And that can be beautiful. And, and that's what I hope that everyone can get from this film is that, that everyone, if they're prepared to face up to the realization that they have cancer and deal with it, Talk to the medical team. Check yourself if, for breast cancer. Check yourself for testicular cancer. Don't be afraid of what you find and think it's going to go away because it won't. Respond. Take your, your findings. In, talk to the people who care about you in, your in your medical community. And everyone at that point has a fighting chance to live. And I think that's what we want to get across here, that we live in a new era of cancer now where it is on the run. It's afraid of us. We don't have to be as afraid of cancer as it is of us now, because we're coming to get it. Great. Great. Just to, to wrap up here, you, you have obviously been, if people who see this movie and people who follow you, this is not the first movie you've been involved in, the first doc. You've been on a hell of a roller coaster ride, professionally and obviously personally. How do you gauge success today as opposed to 1985. Well, uh, look, in the 80s, we were running around and it was all about how many tickets are we sold tomorrow night? You know, is it going to be sold out? How are we above so and so in the charts? Are we going to get on the TV show? None of that matters. You know, we, when we play an alarm show now, we have our love, hope, strength, get on the list booth at the concerts. We're, we're asking people to get on the list, to become lifesavers, to swab their cheeks. And, and that is really quantifies everything we have done as a or I've done as a songwriter or we've achieved as a band we've got people out there that are alive because we've played concerts not just the alarm but bands like Linkin Park or Frank Turner or Flogging Molly or festivals like Bonnaroo, Lollapalooza, Austin City Limits we're swabbing at all those kind of events saving lives with with people in the music industry in the community of musicians and fans and and that is it's it's made a real tangible difference and I think we could only have hoped for that in the 80s but now I can see that it's come true and it's a reality it's just uh, made it's having a match made at an alarm concert which we've had and there's one of our fans come to the concert and they've stepped out and they've given their lifeblood and they've saved somebody's life that's better than all the gold discs I've got on the wall back home by far that is uh, a fascinating way to gauge your success well done Mike Peters
Thank you, Mark. Pleasure to Thanks talk everyone. to you. Look for Mike Peters uh, out starting tomorrow on the Warp Tour. That's right, yeah. Good luck crunching it. I'm guessing you're going to do a full-on punk set. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be fast and furious. Uh, that's it. We're packing a lot in in our set, so uh, it's going to be uh, very exciting for us. And uh, we're looking forward to mixing it up with all the young bands out there. You know, we've had Indeed. loads of support from the young bands for Love, Hope, Strength. Now we're going to show them what the alarm's all about. Talk about they're beating ageism in rock and roll. Way to go. <laughs> Unsafe. And, and look for uh, Man in the Camo Jacket. It's on iTunes now and video on demand. Mike Peters, everybody. Thank Thanks. you very much indeed. Thanks, Mark.